Welcome to today's webinar, the Mycotoxin Outlook for 2018, The Rise of Fumonisins, hosted by Biomin and Romer Labs. Both companies are part of EBA Group, and we're broadcasting live from world headquarters here right here in Austria. My name is Ryan Hines, and I'm the editor of Science and Solutions. Joining me in the studio today are Ines Taschel, Product Manager for Mycotoxin Risk Management at Biomin. Good afternoon. Hi there. And in a change of our speaker lineup, we have Christian Aleo, Head of Marketing and Product Management at Romer Labs. Hello to you. Hello, Ryan. Thank you for coming in at last moment. Um, our previously built speaker is out due to illness, and we wish her a prompt and full recovery. We sure do. So in today's session, we're going to touch on a number of topics, including mycotoxin occurrence, detection methods, and mitigation. I want to remind all of you out there listening on the internet that today's session is an interactive one. When you open the toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll find a chat function for issues regarding audio, visual, technical issues. The questions function can be used at any time throughout the session to enter a question for either of our speakers. After the presentation section today, we're going to finish off with a questions and answers session. You can enter your questions at any time now or save them till that point in our broadcast. In addition, you, the audience, can vote at several points throughout today's discussion. When I announce a poll question, you'll have the opportunity to weigh in with your input in real time. We'll aggregate those results here and I will read them out to you. And we're in fact going to begin with our first poll question now. Poll question one, have you encountered a problem with mycotoxins in the past 12 months? Yes, no, or maybe. Please go ahead and click your answer now. And Enos, while our audience members are doing so, would you please remind us about the relevance of mycotoxins when it comes to feed and farm animals? Well, uh, there is a quite broad spectrum of effects caused by the mycotoxins. And what is really important is to know that really all mycotoxins, even at low concentrations, are causing immune suppression. And on top of this, they can, of course, also cause neurotoxicity or hepatotoxicity and, of course, also carcinogenicity. And on top of this, they can also um, impair the reproduction system and they can cause uh, digestive disorders. And all of these effects will ultimately lead to a decrease in the animal performance, and this will be directly reflected in the economic losses for the livestock industry. And we know that this costs uh, the livestock industry billions of dollars each year. Wow. So definitely a topic, it sounds like, that should be on anyone's radar when it comes to farm animals and health and performance. Now, with that, we're going to close the voting, and I'm going to read out the poll results. And Ines, if you have a look here, we've got actually 65% of our audience today listening who said, yes, mycotoxins um, is something that is a problem they've encountered in the past 12 months. 21% no, and there is a bit of uncertainty. 13% say maybe. What do you think of these results? Are these surprising? So, no, for, the, for me, these results, they are not really surprising. At Biomin, we have been helping clients to cope with the mycotoxin challenges now for over 35 years. And our research and the annual survey program, they show that mycotoxins are indeed a common issue in the animal feed. Great. Now, Ines, you've brought a preview of this year's Biomin mycotoxin survey results with you. Let's have a look at those the survey report in numbers. Now, this program has been running since 2004. The latest year's data includes samples of finished feed and raw commodities, 18,757 of those sourced from 72 different countries and more than 73,000 analyses conducted in order to get to these results. Um, tell us in broad strokes, what does the global picture look like? I uh, yes, I want to show you the global picture on the worldwide contamination, as you can see here. Um, first of all, I want to explain how to read this map. Um, in this world map, uh, the sub-regions of the world are colored according to the percentage of the samples above the risk thresholds. Right, so what do you mean there um, by risk threshold? Could you clarify that for us? Yes, the risk thresholds, they are defined by Biomin and they are um, defined due to worldwide practical experience in the field and also to 
scientific trials and also according to the literature. So what you can see here from yellow to red, um, yellow means that there is a moderate risk and up to red, um, this is representing an extreme risk with more than 75% of the tested samples above these risk thresholds. And when we take a look at the average contamination levels of the worldwide results in 2017, we can see that 62% um, of the feed materials had at least one of the major mycotoxins present at the level that we know that could affect the animal's health or performance. And what we can see is that really all regions are affected by the mycotoxins. So there is no region with no, no effect. And for the full detail in this world map, um, you will receive then in the next 24 hours our Biomine World Mycotoxin Survey report. Sure. And that report is always uh, highly valued by our audience members. So I'm sure that they'll be looking for that in their email inboxes. Uh, now, today's session is billed as the rise of fumonazins. Tell us about that. What's going on? Well, uh, you can see the trend in the occurrence of the fumonazines on this slide here. And what you can see is uh, that the global prevalence of the fumonazines in corn in the last decade, and this is split up into half-year intervals. And it is best to look at corn since this is the main crop affected by fumonazines. And Corn is also the major feed source in the most parts of the world and one of the main crops also sampled in our survey. And what you see is that there are strong fluctuations over the time and these fluctuations, they are mainly caused by the influence of the weather and also the climate change. And also the climate during the growing, flowering and also the harvesting period. And in the last years, there could be observed really a rise of the fumonisins. And please note here um, how fumonisin levels have risen since 2015. And the highest mean value observed in the last 10 years was recorded now in 2017, as you can see here in red. Yeah, certainly a striking picture that, that we see over the past couple of years. So is this a global phenomenon? Is it happening everywhere? And what's behind it? What's causing fumonisins to rise? Yes, so we observed that this trend um, is nearly uh, visible at every continent, except in the certain regions of, of Europe, where the risk was remaining quite stable. But in some parts of Southern Europe, also the fumonisin levels were quite high detected in corn. And this is because higher temperatures around the harvest, they favor the progression of the main fumonisins producing fungi. And Coming to the impacts um, on the fumonisins occurrence, there are many factors that influence the occurrence of fumonisins and of course also other mycotoxins in, in general. So we know, for example, that the climate change will decrease the yields and increase the mycotoxin contamination as this environmental stress has been shown to have significant consequences for the secondary metabolite production and especially on the mycotoxins. And on top of this, also extreme drought episodes, for example, or desertification floods or fluctuations between the wet and the dry cycles have an impact on the life cycles of the mycotoxin producing fungi. And weather conditions at a certain growing stage, for example, flowering and harvesting, they definitely influence the mycotoxin occurrence. And um, to illustrate the impact, of this weather during the harvesting period on mycotoxins formation. I brought you um, once for an example. Okay. And this I want to show here. So what you can see here is some pictures of the harvest conditions in parts of Argentina in 2017. As you can see, there were heavy rainfalls causing flood and you can see that the corn was really totally underwater. And by having a look on the Argentinian corn data after this harvesting time, we really could observe a high risk in fumonisin contamination. And we could observe that really more than two thirds of the samples tested were above the risk threshold. And the average value we could found there was around 3,500 ppp. And this is really, really high. So we can definitely see the impact uh, on the 
climate and the weather conditions on the level of fomonisins. Certainly, very vivid, vivid images there. Thank you for sharing those. Uh, so what does this all mean? Uh, should we be worried? What are the effects of fumonazins when it comes to farm animals? Yes, of course, um, because the fumonazins, they are quite unique among the mycotoxins. Um, they have a special mode of action. As the molecules of the fumonazins, they have a quite similar structure to the sphingoid base, and that's why they interfere with the action of an enzyme which is necessary for the sphingolipid production. And we know that the sphingolipids, um, they play a key role in the cell functions all around the body. And in addition, the fumonisins are carcinogenic and this, they are suppressing the immune system. And um, they are particularly toxic to pigs um, as they can cause pulmonary edema and also pancreatic necrosis, for example. By having a look at poultry, um, poultry is a bit less susceptible to formonisins, but in high concentrations, um, liver necrosis and disorders of the nervous system can be observed. And additionally, we can also observe uh, gut damage, for example. Okay, now, did you observe any other trends besides the rise of fumonisins that would impact or are likely to impact the industry in 2018? Yes, I was summing up uh, the highlights on this slide here. Um, by having a look uh, on the South American countries, for example, we can see an increase in the occurrence of Don and also fumonisins and also in soya beans. So soya bean, it was once considered as a low mycotoxin risk crop, has become now a crop to monitor more closely because we see that it's affected more and more. And this is more than a local issue, uh, as we know that the soya beans produced in the South America are exported and including the animals' diets uh, throughout the world. So really, nearly every country in the world is, is affected by high contamination in, in these South American countries. And by having a look at the Europe, we could observe a sharp increase in the prevalence of T2 toxin in cereals and also on the level of Don and Fum in corn we could observe an increase. And especially in Northern Europe, um, the T2 toxin was really present at the high levels. Okay. Now, researchers have identified hundreds of different mycotoxins and metabolites. Uh, in this latest analysis, how many of those would you find in an average sample? Yeah, you can see this um, from our 2017 results uh, of Spectrum 380. So Spectrum 380 is a state-of-the-art method offered by Biomin. And with this method, um, we are able to measure more than 380 mycotoxins and, and secondary metabolites. And what you can see here on the slides that um, there were 905 samples analyzed last year. And what you can also see is that the co-contamination um, is really very common. Just to explain, on the left side, you can see this light orange graph. And um, on the x-axis, we have the metabolites per sample. And on the y-axis, you can see the proportion of the samples in percent. And what you can clearly see is that most of the samples, they contain between 20 and 29 different metabolites. And on average, we detected 32 metabolites per sample. And we also observed that 9.7 out of 10 samples were contaminated with fusarium toxins. And this is really a lot because nearly or every sample is, is affected by these toxins. And we can also see that 97% of all samples tested they were contaminated with more than 10 different toxins and metabolites. So this is really, really a lot. Sure. So it sounds like there are many different mycotoxins in the mix, uh, so to speak. Are mycotoxins occurring in similar patterns everywhere, or do we see geographic variation? Yes, of course. Um, we can see geographic variations. And let me go through this on a region-by-region -region basis. So we have for each region a map that shows the sub-regional risks. And I want to start here with Asia. Um, in general, Asia has seen an increase this year in the overall proportion of risk samples. 
And the rise has been seen mainly in East Asia, where we had last year already 86% risk level. But this year, um, there was again an increase, and we could see a risk level of 92%. In Southern Asia, in Southeast Asia, we were reaching a level of 74% this year. And in Australia, um, the levels, they were quite moderate, but also an increase from 16% last year to now 27% risk in 2017. And last but not least, South Asia. Um, there was a very high risk level showed last year, and we had a bit of a decrease now, but again reaching a risk level of 70%, so this is still very high. And what does that mean then for particular animal species? Yes, this is exactly what I want to show you here now. Um, first of all, I want to explain the graphs, how to read them. So the gray bars indicate the proportion of samples with each mycotoxin detected. And the pictures of the animals are colored according to the proportion of samples above the risk threshold for each animal type. So what you can see here in Asia is that Don is one of the main uh, concerns in all species. And in Asia, there could be observed a high risk for pigs, poultry, and ruminants as well. So really, all species are affected. And formonisin levels are more of a concern for pigs, as you can see here in orange. And also for Zen, we had really um, effects on pigs and poultry, as you can see as well in the orange colors. Aflatoxin occurred in 38% of the samples in Asia, but as you can see, the levels, they were not that alarming for the single species. And what about elsewhere in the world, for example, here in Europe? Yes, I'm coming to Europe now in the next slide. Um, in Europe, there was a slight decrease of dawn um, in Central Europe. But still, um, more than two-thirds of all samples were tested positive for dawn in this region. And this decrease was only detected in this region and in southern, eastern, and northern Europe, the dawn levels were increasing, as well as also the levels of formonisins. And in southern Europe, um, we had 84% of all tested samples positive for formonisins. And also, the occurrence of T2 toxin was increasing this year in the European countries, as I mentioned it already at the beginning for Northern Europe. And in Northern Europe, we have now already 48% um, of the tested samples positive. And overall, as you can see here, there was a risk level detected of 57% in Northern Europe, 67% um, in Central Europe, we had 37% in Southern and then 65% in Eastern Europe positive samples. And by having a look again on the animal species, it's similar like in last year, like in 2016, also this year, Don was really the standard mycotoxin of concern. And those Don levels, they are frequently at the level of concern for pig and poultry, as you can see here in orange. And all the other toxins, they were occurring quite often. But yeah, however, the risk the levels, they were quite moderate in this region. So could you tell us, give us a picture of the situation in the Middle East when it comes to mycotoxins? Of course. Um, in the Middle East, the total risk level was increasing up to 61%. And especially the contamination with formonisins Dioxinivalenol and ochotoxin was rising in this region. And by having a closer look, we can see a foam contamination of 74% uh, detected in the samples from this region. And overall, in this region, we can say that the risk remains high and this poses a risk to the animals. Um, coming to the species um, in this region, uh, we can also see high levels of concern for dawn. All animal species, they are marked in, in orange. And furthermore, we also observed an interestingly high prevalence of serralinone here. And especially 
for pigs and poultry, the levels are really risky. So please consider these mycotoxins in particular in breeding operations. So coming to Africa, in Africa, the total risk level was increasing up to 74%. And especially the contamination with fumonisin, stone and ochatoxin was rising also in this region. Overall, the risk uh, remains high. And for seralenon and aflatoxin, there was a slight decrease detected in the samples um, for Africa. And having a look now at the species in this region, it's again dawn and foam occurring the most here, but please watch also the aflat levels in some areas. And you have to know that these overall results, they including South Africa and in our survey, most of the samples, they come from South Africa. And in South Africa, the AFLA problem, problem is not that um, big. And please consider that in, in the other regions of Africa, there is really a problem with this toxin. So AFLA toxin levels are higher in other parts of Africa? Yes, but unfortunately, we do not have that many data from this region. OK. Uh, what about the Western Hemisphere? Can you paint us a picture there? Yeah, of course, I also prepared the slides for the Americas, um, starting with North America by having a look on the North America. We can see um, a risk level now of 80% in 2017. Just to compare, in 2016, we had a risk level of um, 66%. So this was really increasing. And Don and Servalenon were the highest annual threats in this region. And as you maybe know, um, that these two toxins can work together to make things even worse for the animal. And let's also have a look on the fumonisins. They are also representing a high threat in this region, especially for pigs, as you can see again here in orange. Right. So last but not least, coming to Central and South America. Um, in Central America, the risk uh, remains quite high at the level of 80%. And in South America, the risk level rose from 60% in 2016 now to 74% of samples at the level of concern, particularly in the first half of the year. And again, the species, Central and South America, as you can see, they're really showing high risks for all animal species. And again, Don and Fum, they were really occurring in high levels and they are representing really a high threat in this region, as you can see here in orange and also in red. Great. Thank you for that, Ines. Uh, we appreciate you sharing that preview of the latest survey results with us. Uh, we're now going to turn to the topic of mycotoxin detection, and we're going to do so by opening up our second poll question. Our poll question two is, how do you test for mycotoxins? Please choose the answer that best fits your situation, on-site testing, external analytical service, we do not currently test, or not sure. Now, Christian, while they're answering, tell me a bit about Romer Labs, which has been expanding its testing into other analytes, such as pathogens and GMOs as of late. Uh, but actually, when you go back to the beginnings of the company, this was a mycotoxin testing firm, isn't that right? That's correct, Ryan. Mycotoxins have been at the heart of Romer Labs since our beginnings in 1982. Now, with more than 35 years of experience in this field, we feature one of the broadest portfolio of mycotoxin testing solutions on the market, ranging from on-site screening methods to products and solutions for reference testing methods, which are applied in, in a lab. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you for sharing that. We're going to close the voting now, and I'm going to read out the results. Now, our internet audience is telling us that 35% currently use on-site testing, a full 50% use external analytical service, 10% currently do not test, and 5% are not sure at this point. Uh, Christian, the, the fact that the majority of our listeners are using an external analytical service, how does that match with what you've seen in the market? Well, overall, the, the results are not really surprising. 
Uh, summing up, we have more than 80%, so 85% of our viewers testing for mycotoxins. And this is, this is quite, a, quite a high number. And this is pretty much in line with what we are hearing from the market. People realize that you can't really manage what you don't measure. Uh, you can't manage the mycotoxin risk without measuring the prevalence of mycotoxins in raw materials and feed. Uh, a proper mycotoxin assessment is therefore key in defining the right mycotoxin management strategy. And to be honest, with current available methods, it has actually never been easier to test for mycotoxins. So Christian, tell us about those uh, available methods. What's currently available? And if you've got multiple options, presumably, how do you choose the right one? Sure. So when it comes to testing for mycotoxins, I think the first thing we need to decide is whether we run the test ourselves on site or we send samples in to an analytical service lab. This decision depends on three main considerations, and these are the required testing throughput, the acceptable time to result, and the required quality of results. Uh, for high volume or frequent testing, for instance, it might be worth conducting tests on site since the costs are generally low. If you only perform occasional testing or have low throughput, sending your samples to an, to an analytical service lab could be more convenient for you. Now, when it comes to the time to result, on-site rapid tests will deliver results within an hour, with lateral flow devices even as fast as 10 minutes. This makes rapid tests the tool of choice when decision time is short, like for instance, when deciding whether to accept a grain truck uh, delivery at a raw material reception point. On the other side, from start to finish, analytical service results can take anywhere from two days to a week. So that's quite a big difference there. Right. Now, uh, lastly, when it comes to the required result quality, some on-site tests can be categorized as screening tools in that they provide a quick indication of the presence of just one analyte per test. Reference methods, however, available at an analytical service laboratory are certainly more robust. This offer greater reliability on a larger number of analytes. And this is also due to the fact that many have an accredited process behind. Now, before we get to those, can you first tell us about the on-site method? Sure, uh, let me talk about two of these. Uh, when it comes to testing on-site, the most popular methods are strip tests and ELISA tests. These are both antibody-based methods, but differ in some key areas. Strip tests are designed to give results as soon as possible, though they can only process two samples at a time. We are therefore widely used at reception points in the supply chain of agricultural raw commodities, as just mentioned. ELISA, on the other hand, so enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays, can test up to 44 samples simultaneously. In general, therefore, ELISA is the better option when you have six or more samples. The price difference here is quickly compensated due to the need to buy fewer kits and also due to the obvious time savings. Sure. So if I have a low number of samples to test or I need accredited results, then I imagine we're talking about an external service lab. What are my options there? Well, that, that's, that's a really good point because when sending samples to an analytical service lab, you have to decide which technology should be used. So in addition to classic ELISA, reference methods like HPLC, so high performance liquid chromatography and LCMSMS, so liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry can be chosen. The key differences here are related mainly to price, the number of analytes per run and test accuracy. Reference methods analyze your sample for multiple toxins in one go, and that's certainly a big advantage. For example, the LCMSMS multi mycotoxin method currently developed by Romalabs is capable of analyzing more than 50 toxins at a time. Great. Now, many of our viewers are interested in getting fast results on site. Uh, when it comes to on site testing, how easy is it for a new user? to get set up, get operating with one of these kits? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a question that we get quite uh, quite often. So the setup is really simple and fast. Uh, all you need is actually a room with a standard power supply. Everything else can be provided by Romelabs, for example. The handling is very simple, as you need only a few procedural steps to conduct the testing. You can learn it within, I would say, half an hour. When completing the test, you get straightforward results, which can easily be documented. And this is also something that uh, people find really very helpful. Now, on-site tests consist of three simple steps. Sample preparation, 
the analysis and result documentation. So first, mycotoxins are extracted from grain kernels into a liquid to make them accessible for the analysis. In the past, this was done with hazardous organic solvents, like methanol, for example. Nowadays, um, our Watex technology allows for mycotoxin extraction using only water in combination with an environmental-friendly buffer bag. This makes the purchase, the handling, and the disposal of organic solvents obsolete. This technology also enables the analysis of aflatoxins, deoxynivalenol, sierralenone, and fumonisins from the same sample extract. And this is really tremendously reducing testing time. Well, great. Time savings and an eco-friendly option there. Sounds like a winning proposition. Uh, so can you walk us through the test procedure with one of these? Of course. So you would actually start by simply adding your grounded sample, a buffer bag and bottled water in a filter bag, shake it and then let it settle. Filter and buffer bags are provided with a kit, so there is no need to purchase anything extra. Because the wheel bag bags used provide an integrated filter, there are no additional filtration or any centrifugation steps required. In the second step, the analysis of the sample takes place on a dipstick that is similar to a pregnancy test. The strip test is put into the diluted sample extract and then put in an incubator for three minutes. Then the analysis is completed and a reader quantifies the result within just seconds. This shows a measurement, in this case, a concentration value such as PPB, that you can assess the quality of your raw material. The last step is to document the results. This can be done either by printout or by transfer to a computer, as you can see in the displayed summary. This provides you with objective results that you can file for later use. And that's it. Okay, wow. Thank you, Christian, for sharing those insights on mycotoxin detection. Sure. We're going to turn now to the topic of mycotoxin mitigation. Now, once you have your test results in hand and you've identified a contamination issue in your feed, you're probably going to want to find uh, some sort of solution to protect your animals. Uh, let's talk a bit about those solutions. Uh, first, getting your input there in the internet uh, with our third poll question. In the past 12 months, which mycotoxin mitigation methods have you used? Now, please choose the answer that best suits you between mycotoxin binder, multi-strategy mycotoxin deactivator, good quality control and feed management, mycotoxins are not an issue, or I'm currently looking for a solution. And while they're doing that, Ines, would you quickly give us the distinction between those first two options there? Of course. Uh, so what is a binder? A binder is typically a bentonite or a clay that is able to bind aflatoxins. But with a binder, you are not able to get rid of, of all the other mycotoxins. And on the opposite, the multi-strategy is a more innovative solution. And this solution is containing different strategies to counteract different mycotoxins, not only the aflatoxins. All right. Thanks for that explanation, Ines. Uh, the voting is now closed and I'm going to read out the results. Here we have from your input and our internet listeners are telling us 38% use a mycotoxin binder added to feed. 31% are using a multi-strategy mycotoxin deactivator. 40% use good quality control and feed management. 10% are not currently experiencing an issue and 16% are in the market for a solution. Uh, so that's pretty interesting to see those results. What do you make of the fact that quality control and mycotoxin binders are so prominent? Is that a sufficient solution based on what you're seeing from the survey data? Yeah, of course, you can use a binder. And we know that many people are just using binder and they think then it's, it's OK. But even if you select a proven and reliable binder, you are still only solve one part of the problem because we know that most of the common mycotoxins they are not able to be bound for example as we heard um, in our annual survey is dawn really the most common mycotoxin and dawn is not able to be bound so we need to add a couple of more strategies to the mycotoxin risk management to address also these less bound mycotoxins and of course we know every farm is different, and with your detection results in hand, a biomine representative can always help um, 
you to find the right uh, solution to get rid of the problem of mycotoxins and they will find the solution that fit uh, best for your needs. Okay, so if other strategies are needed to address other types of mycotoxins, uh, what are those strategies? Will you flesh that out for us and explain them? Yeah, I want to show you this um, on our Microfix fifth generation. Um, as we know, as I told you already, mycotoxins, they have really different structures and that's why we need really different strategies to counteract them. And Microfix um, has three different strategies. It's the absorption, the biotransformation, and also the bioprotection. Um, with the absorption, we have the bentonite. It is proven by going through the full process of the EU authorization for the binding of aflatoxins. And what does this mean? This means that the binding is also proven in real farm conditions. Then we have the biotransformation component, and this is containing the fumzyme for the degradation of fumonisins and also the BBSH for the breakdown of trichotithines. And on top of this, we have the M MTV component, and this is responsible for counteracting the seralenone and the ochotoxins. And additionally, um, Microfix contains the bioprotection component, and this component um, helps you to protect the liver and also the immune system from the effects of, of the mycotoxins. Okay, now there are many anti-mycotoxin products available on the market. What is it that sets Microfix apart from the rest? Yes, Biomin is the first and only company um, with five EU authorizations. Um, for three different ingredients to deactivate the mycotoxins. And since 2013 and 2014, we have the reg registration for the bentonite for all animal species and the BBSH and the purified enzyme for um, the, fumon the counteracting the fumonisins, it's the fumzyme. And this was registered uh, for pigs. And we are happy that in 2017, now we got also the registration of BBSH and Fumzyme, also for all avian species. And part of achieving the EU authorization for the biotransformation aspect um, was to prove that the approaches are effective at degrading the target mycotoxins and that they are degraded into compounds of low or even no toxicity. And yeah, of course, Biomin leads this technology worldwide thanks to a true commitment to research and development. So on the topic of R&D, uh, can you tell me about the science of how Microfix works and the proof that it does? Yes, of course. So um, to reach this registration, there are a lot of requirements necessary. Uh, for example, you have to run several trials to prove the safety and also the efficacy of the products. And Biomin has really a lot of cooperation with leading universities all around the world. And as you can see here, there were also several peer-reviewed papers published in this field, as it is really required to prove the efficacy of the product, not only in vitro, but also in vivo. So this is really important to have this. Absolutely. Now, we've had many questions already come in today, uh, and several of them are asking about inclusion rates. So what is the correct inclusion rate of Microfix in diets in order to achieve a sufficient level of protection? Well, this is not so easy to answer because um, the inclusion rate uh, depends on different factors. And first of all, you have to consider the contamination levels and also the mycotoxins which are occurring in your diet. And it also depends on the production stage and on the animal species. But anyway, as I mentioned already before, you can always contact the sales rep representative from Biomin and they will help you with your needs and they will, of course, help you to find the right solution for your farm. Excellent. Thank you for that explanation, Ines. Um, before we move on, I just want to take the opportunity to point out a handy tool for our audience to stay up to date on the latest results of the Biomin Mycotoxin Survey. You can have those on your smartphone or tablet device, whether Apple or Android operating systems. But that is available for download for free on biomin.net, on the Apple iTunes Store, and on the Google Store.
Next, we are going to open it up to some questions from the audience. Oh, and I should point out also the Mycotoxin Site Info blog for any specific information regarding mycotoxins, their structure, their effects in animals. That's also an available resource. On to the Q&A, as promised. Uh, Kristen, Christian, let's start with you. Which raw materials are mostly affected by fumonacins? Ryan, I think it is briefly touched on this already. Uh, I think earlier uh, data shows that fumonacins are usually found in corn and corn-based products. And I think from what we heard earlier, uh, the biomine mycotoxin survey results confirms this. Great. Uh, we still have plenty of questions coming in. We're going to try to get a few more answered. What, um, Ines, this one is for you then. Uh, it relates to young animals. What kind of impact can we expect on young poultry exposed to certain various levels of mycotoxins? Um, your mycotoxins, they affect poultry in a wide range. We know this, and um, this is varying from immune suppression to increased mortality in severe cases. And generally speaking, um, you can always say the younger the animal, the higher the risk for the mycotoxicosis at the immune system. And this is because the immune system is developing and the defense mechanisms are negatively influenced by the mycotoxins. And um, this can, of course, lead to a reduced growth or to uh, interference with the re reproductive uh, system. And in general, you can say the younger the animals, the higher is the susceptibility to diseases. Okay, and is that specifically applied to poultry or is it more in general young animals are susceptible? No, this is not only for poultry, um, it's, it's in general. For all animal species, the younger the animals, the more they, they suffer from the, the mycotoxins. Okay. Uh, now, it looks like the questions continue to roll in. Uh, we won't be able to answer all of them today, but there will be a follow-up via email and on our both companies' websites. Uh, Christian, we have one here for you about uh, milk. How can one effectively screen for aflatoxin M1 in milk? Okay. Um, aflatoxin is known to metabolize and be carried over as aflatoxin M1 into milk. Uh, many countries have really extremely strict regulations for aflatoxin M1. And with regulatory limits in a PPT range. No, just a minute. Uh, PPT range? Can you explain what that is for those who don't know in the audience? Uh, sure. PPT, it's parts per trillion. Okay. And maybe to get an idea what this means, you can see it as representing a single second in 32,000 uh, years. So it's an extremely low concentration. Okay. So uh, I was mentioning that regulatory limits are really very low. Mm. Uh, so testing methods have to be very sensitive. Sure. Reference methods like HPLC and LCMSMS and ELISA tests are currently the methods of choice. And to choose among these, you could apply the principles I just presented earlier. Okay, great. So Ines, here we have a question um, that regards detecting mycotoxicity. So clinical signs are well documented in, in many species, uh, but how can I go about detecting subclinical mycotoxicity? This listener asks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is really a good question. Um, mycotoxins, they have different effects on various organs, on the animal's productivity and also on the health. And it is not easy to detect subclinical toxicity, although it is obvious that there are already an effect of the toxins long time before the symptoms are visible for us. And mycotoxins, um, they are affecting more than one system simultaneously. And therefore, they are producing many types of responses in the affected animals. So you can see nothing at the beginning, but the animals, they are already affected. Okay, so just a general sense or some sort of indication of something that's that's not normal, but hard to pinpoint. Yeah, I guess. for example, you can see a reduction in the in the growth or something like this, and you don't know what it is or the 
animals, they are behaving a bit different than normal, and this could be already an effect of mycotoxins. So in, in that case, uh, would it be, uh, would screening the, the feed and the feed commodities be a good solution there? Of course, yeah. You always uh, should screen for um, the mycotoxins so that you, you always know um, what you have to counteract. Christian, would you agree with that assessment? I would, yeah. Okay, great. Um, we're going to try to take just a few more questions before we round out today's session. Uh, Christian, back to you. Um, back on the topic of fumonazins, what's the best method for determining fumonazins that is quick, accurate over a wide range of concentrations, and inexpensive? Yeah, price is, is, is always an issue. And if that's the case, so it's if it price you're worried about, then uh, I think rapid testing solutions might be worth looking into. Both lateral flow and ELISAs are accurate and quick methods for detecting fumonisins. For example, our aggressive Watex test kit has been approved by Chipsa, therefore testifying to its accuracy. Furthermore, its range of applications has been recently extended to 100 ppm, which also covers then a broad contamination range. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And final question, Ines. Um, earlier, you spoke about certain combinations of mycotoxins, such as the Don and Fum, um, and said so that those were particularly um, negatively impacting animals. Tell us some more about that. That's um, what's referred to as synergism. Is that correct? Yes, I mentioned it already, as you, you said. Um, it is definitely standard to, to find more than one mycotoxin present in one feed sample. We saw this also on our Spectrum 380 results. And uh, if there are different mycotoxins present at one time, this is uh, leading to so-called synergistic effects. And what does synergistic effect means? It means that um, the effects caused by the single mycotoxins are impressed uh, much more severe. So simply said, one plus one is not two, but one plus one is, for example, 10. So just to give you an example on Don and Fum. So if Don and Fum is present, um, the effects of those toxins on the animals are much more severe than if they would occur alone. Okay. Yeah. So definitely something that needs to be looked out for that certainly advocates for perhaps that multi-strategy approach that you've detailed for us. Yes, of course. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Ines and Christian, thank you both for being here, for presenting, for bringing your expertise to bear on these topics today. Um, Welcome. We're going to now close our session. I'd also like to thank, of course, our audience for being here, for participating, for giving your input during the polls. Uh, today's session has been recorded. Uh, you're going to receive a follow-up email that includes links to the recording and a number of resources, including the uh, soon to be published Biomin Mycotoxin Survey Annual Report, preview of which Enos gave you, um, a Romer Labs Mycotoxin Sampling Guide, and a link to a mycotoxin testing video. Those will be following in the next 24 hours. Um, in addition, as soon as I close today's session, you'll be prompted to answer a short survey on today's webinar. It will take about two minutes to complete, and we ask that you please do so. By providing your feedback, you allow us to improve our webinar program and identify future topics for discussion. So I want to thank you again for listening. We're going to close today's session. On behalf of Biomin and Roman Labs, I want to thank you for joining.